four fifteen, February eighteenth, twenty twenty two. Feeling a little under the weather today, Ben. Got to yes. admit. So forgive me for my low energy today. Wait, I'm gonna try to muster it. I'm a pro here. I'm gonna pro. I'm gonna muster the energy. You got it. You got keep it. it. Keep it. Keep it high. Keep the high yes. level here. Okay. Good. All soon right. You can shut it down. Pretty soon we'll be able to shut it all down for the week. Mm-hmm. Rest and recover. That's it. Yeah. Uh, busy week though. Busy week. A lot going on. There's not very many weeks anymore where it's not. I mean, maybe summer, maybe over Christmas, but uh, world's a fast-paced place these days. Really is. Really is. You asked me an interesting question today about why markets aren't open 24-7, 365. Yeah. And so I think, I think it's I, I think it's a possibility. And certainly as blockchain takes on more uh, attention and securities get tokenized, mm-hmm. there's a real possibility that we move towards that. Yeah, but for the meantime, it's still people run you're mentioning, right? So it's yes. I mean you can really still do it 24-7. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'd probably you certainly have lower volumes overnight. You all well, you'd think you would, but maybe not. Yeah, I mean crypto is one of the first kind of asset classes that trades 24 7 365 so you, you, you definitely just like most markets right you see the flows change uh, uh, depending on who's trading and time of day they're trading so crypto is a decent test case to see how people trade and when the volumes are and certainly right now the futures market like institutional money can still trade in after hours because the futures market is actually transacting there is transactions happening behind the scenes from institutions um, but yeah liquidity is a, a huge issue so sometimes that's an opportunity yep for sure yeah all right let's get fired up here let's get fired up i'm just gonna have a sip of the buble here mm-hmm. oh yeah that's good okay all right so what uh we mentioned it was a busy week what what did you get up to this week yeah, well, you know, this was, uh, I guess it was last weekend where we had the potential threat for a Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of f- f- fed over into uh, into the start of the week and we saw that happening and there's been continued feed and discussion around Ukraine-Russia, um, I think, as uh, you've probably followed it a fair bit too. And you know, ultimately, I guess the question is, what does he want and what is he doing, Putin? And it seems like he wants an additional pipeline um, or uh, uh, pipeline to run into Europe. So he's got more access. They can pump more gas into Europe. And, uh, you know, I, ultimately, they need Germany to ratify it. Germany doesn't have a lot of gas. They rely on Russia for the gas, most of Europe. And so, you know, I think this is really the overarching reason there's uh, you know other arguments that they want the agriculture that ukraine has ultimately i think it's about money and power and so i I don't think it escalates and hopefully it doesn't Uh, but it seems like that's where most of the attention is going towards uh towards that conflict and so that came over into the week here um seemed like it settled down maybe on Tuesday, Wednesday, we saw the Fed release its minutes. Um, not a lot of action from there, um, but uh, you know, generally speaking, we continue to look at uh, you know, central banks talking about raising rates. We had Bullard speak a couple of times on Monday. He said we should raise faster, 50 basis points right away. And then he spoke today as well. Same kind of tone, which is we need to raise rates. Um, the sector uh, that didn't like that uh, continues to be technology. And, you know, as we, as we come into this week, um, you know, there were, there were good stocks that are down, you know, 40, 50% from November um, where, you know, Facebook, Shopify, uh, we saw Roku today, which is down a big number. I, I think almost 80% from its peak and Roku mm-hmm. is similar to Netflix, but they, they kind of amalgamate all the different streaming services into one. Um, so, so these big companies coming under, under serious pressure here. And, uh, you know, here we are today coming into this weekend, the market's still really kind of ugly. I think people are a little bit 
still fearful of the U, uh, Ukraine Russia conflict um, and economic data continues to, to pile in um, here. So, you know, kind of a bad week for the market, good week for bonds and gold. Um, so uh, that was positive. But on the other side of it, the risk side of it, I look at these companies too, and I look at Shopify, Facebook, Roku, and you know, the valuations have come down. I mean, Facebook trades at like 10, 12 times earnings um, versus the S&P at 26 times earnings. Um, so, you know, from a longer term perspective, I start to think, you know, maybe, maybe this is worth starting to consider, uh, you know, adding uh, more significantly to those positions. Yeah, that was going to be my question. So, like, as far as the technology and some of these taking, like, 50 to 80% drawdowns, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, when do you start to look at, you know, maybe buying up some of these tech stocks? Mm -hmm. I'd say now, like, I look at it now. Um, you know, it's an interesting conundrum that we have here where some of these stocks are down huge, but the index isn't yet. And so it's a little bit of uh, looking at it and saying, okay, these tech stocks are down hard. Index hasn't corrected yet. Economic data still says we're going to have one of the toughest Q2 that we've ever seen. So, you know, I guess the question is, is the, uh, are these companies already pricing in uh, what they're what's coming ahead based on their earnings and I think some of them probably are um, if you look at Shopify good business good growth company um, they could still come down a little bit further but a Facebook at, for example you know does it come down a lot further maybe you know if we get a reasonable correction here maybe it goes to six times earnings eight times earnings which is typical in a in a, in a deep sell-off um so but you know they're starting to look attractive and i think if you take a you know you take a 12 month to, to three year view uh, on some of those names then i think you can buy them reasonably here but it depends on risk tolerance so you know that comes into where i would put it in portfolios and in whose portfolios but if you got a longer term time, time horizon i think some of these names are quite attractive Mm, interesting yeah. yep okay uh anything else under that uh umbrella or did you want to get right to the uh ben's charts segment yeah i think we can get into charts i don't have too too much to add on i mean if people have questions about individual names certainly I, we can go into it um uh, but from a uh from uh from from a perspective of those things yeah i don't don't have anything to add at, at this point okay yeah, let's get right into Ben's charts. All Always right. a treat. <laughs> All right. Yep. So, so for anyone that probably watches uh, the financial media, we got uh, we got so much jargon. I think one of the things that Scott and I have talked about as he's uh, joined the industry, it's been like this finance is so jargony <laughs> and so one of one of the things that has been talked about a lot is kind of the 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 yield curve inversion and so and a lot of people like to sound smart when they talk about the twos tens and thinks that uh, that's interesting anyways two-year yields and the 10-year yields like these are i mean this is historically uh, with 100% accuracy, uh, predicted a recession. And so uh, whenever we've seen the two-year yield, which uh, you know right now is running around kind of, uh, we'll say, 1, 170, and the 10-year yield is around 190-something, um, you know, when the two-year yield is higher than the 10-year yield, that's a, that's a twos, tens inversion. And so part of why I wanted to put it up this way and why it's important to kind of look at it is if we look at where we've had similar scenarios where we get that inversion, which was kind of 2000, everyone remembers that, similar setup from a tech perspective, 2007, 2008, we saw it invert. Um, some of these other periods, not as deep, but this one certainly, which is very close, everyone should remember. In 2019, we saw yield curve inversion kind of at the end of the year. And this was one of the many signals that I looked at, but certainly one of them that heavily influenced my decision to be defensive coming into 2020. 
And so here we are uh, starting to, again, head in that direction where we're starting to see the possibility that we see that inversion where the short end is higher than the long end. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if we get to that point and cross that point, um, you know, we, as I say, historically, that's been a hundred percent leading indicator to a recession. So worth certainly paying attention to looking at thinking about it. And the reason this happens is because the central bank controls the short end, uh, the long ends controlled by the bond market. Certainly you could provide an argument that the long end has more control now by the central bank because of all of their purchasing of bonds. But from this perspective, they can push and move rates. And that's uh, what we talk about. And, you know, what CNBC and uh, BNN would talk about is you know, central banks are, are moving the short end of that curve. Right. Makes sense. Yep. Yeah, definitely jargony. <laughs> Not so much of your explanation, but it's the industry in general. Yes. So I was trying to trying to simplify it out there. And so I've put this up before. This is Jeremy Grantham. Some uh, you know, some clients follow him as as do I. And uh, he's one of the few kind of value investors. And I'll say value value from the perspective is that he provides and has always given a forecast based on valuations. Um, and uh, he wrote a great piece recently about valuations, a pretty long document, but certainly interesting from a perspective of historical thinking about, you know, current value uh, reflects future returns. And so this is his most recent, which just came out today. Um, based on his seven-year forecast, and he always gives seven-year forecasts. Um, this is his, his expectations for returns uh, for the different asset classes. And so, um, you know, I think it's important to look at it and think about it. Um, it's over a longer period period of time. And I've, I've said this before, you know, Scott and I, we've had conversations about, you know, have there ever been periods where markets have gone sideways? And I have said, you know, sometimes we do get in that environment. And so this is worth paying attention to. I do think valuations matter. Um, and, and, but this is over a seven year time frame worth paying attention to and thinking about where, uh, where the opportunities may be. And so obviously at a quick glance, he thinks emerging markets is the place from a valuations perspective. And it certainly is true. I'd say over that seven year time frame, you know, I've added some exposure back to China, which we've talked about maybe a little bit bumpy here short term. Uh, but I think over the medium term, it's one of the few areas that have the, uh, a really good risk reward set up at this point. Okay, great. Good. Yep. Totally unrelated to finance, but it is Olympic week and there's tons of scandals. <laughs> and so I don't know if you look at this historically, but, you know, it's interesting uh, as well with with the doping obviously always comes into the Olympics. Um, and uh, this is based on the Winter Olympics. But, you know, uh, over the last 50 years, there's been, uh, I guess, uh, 89 positive tests, doping scandals. Um, Sochi was a huge one with 55. Yeah. Um, and uh, certainly if, you've lo if you look at why everyone talks about Russia so frequently and why they've been banned and why they're ROC and not uh, um, actually the Rus country of Russia, you know, of the people that have lost medals, in the Olympics and the Winter Olympics, you know, the, the majority of them, if we look at the breakdown here, are all Russians. There's only a couple, I think there's three that were non Russians that have lost medals as a result of their doping. And so, interesting look back. I mean, it seems to get a lot of attention um, and why Russia continues to be put under the microscope. Um, you've maybe followed some of it with this, uh, the, the uh, Russian figure skater who's been allowed to compete, even though she had a positive test. Um, it's uh, interesting, always uh, Olympic time to see uh, what's happening there from a, from a scandal perspective. Definitely. Yeah. I don't know. Did you ever see the movie Icarus? I did not watch it. Oh, man, you need to. That's uh, oh, okay. about the Russian doping scandal, Icarus, okay. for anybody that wants to see it. Yeah. It's uh, from a few years ago, but I think it details like exactly how Russia did it. 
with all like these secret rooms and everything it's i think it was from sochi i'm pretty sure but okay very very interesting uh, documentary i'll check it out yeah check it out have you been watching the olympics uh no no yeah no. not as not as much as i would like so that was, okay. that was an interesting look at uh the uh the medals that have been taken away oh yeah definitely yeah, yeah. Is that it for men's charts? It for my charts today. All right. All mm-hmm. right. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. As we uh, get down to the end here, if anybody has any questions, mm-hmm. um, I thought Kathy Woods had an interesting comment this week about people shorting innovation. Right? Yeah. She yeah. Thought it was sad that Americans are shorting innovation. Yeah. Right? What, do you, what do you think about that? Because Kathy Woods is somebody we typically like, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're going to, I, I have mixed feelings about it. Obviously I like, I like Kathy. I like what she's doing. I like her view. Uh, I think that if you're going to participate in the public markets, like she does, yeah. you gotta take, you gotta take the good with the bad and you gotta realize that people want to, you know, that if she is, presently a whipping post because she's gone down a lot um and uh she's right but yeah people are you know opportunistic and it's really the momentum trade that's been kind of selling down uh, on the positions that she owns and so yeah she's uh, she's got beat up i uh uh, but at the same time, it's interesting to look at the flows and, um, you know, you haven't seen mass liquidation of her funds and ETFs. Um, and so there's some that I follow that say we haven't seen capitulation yet on her holdings. Um, and there's others that say, you know, it's a, it's a testament to, you know, the belief of where this is going to be long term. And so, yeah, people are, are shorting it, but you're in the public markets and, you know, people are opportunistic and they want to make money. And that's kind of the, the, the short of it. You're going to participate this way. You got to deal with the the ramifications of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It came off as kind of, uh, I'm taking my ball and going home type thing. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. So what are we looking forward to for next week? Well, come coming in last week of uh, February. So, um, from a market perspective, uh, let's see let's see where we go. Um, pretty negative sentiment coming in to the close here. Uh, you know, Keith, who, been, who I follow on, is he kind of alerts when he does his individual trades. So his, his long one stock and short three, which is very rare that he comes into a kind of a neutral position. Um, so I'd say it's, it's kind of a, a, a neutral setup for next week. Um, so it wouldn't be surprised to see, uh, you know, markets, uh, get a bit of a bounce because we've had continued selling this week. Um, but, uh, you know, as I look at Q2, it continued to line up with the, the view that I think we see the economy slowing. And so from, from this week perspective, I did sell MicroStrategy, which uh, is a position that we've owned on and off for a couple of years. Um, it was more of a view of trying to reduce some exposure to crypto here. Uh, so I sold MicroStrategy, uh, vintage wine estates, and put the proceeds into long bonds. Um, so that trade's been good. It's been uh, long bonds are up about two percent from where we did that. Micro strategies down about eight percent, and vintage wines down about three. So it's been a good move from that perspective. But I've been trying to find places to to reduce risk and add protection, and so I did that this week. And I'd expect to continue to stay that way. If the bond market gives an opportunity, I'll continue to to buy it and add it because I think yields go a lot lower. I think uh, once uh, we get into Q2 here and the, the world and the economy sees that things aren't as good as we expect, you know, I, I see that 10-year kind of moving towards one from kind of the 180, 190 level we're at. And that would be obviously a huge capital gains for bonds and portfolios. All right. Okay. Anything? Uh, that's it for the week? 
that's it for the week, I guess, again, last week of February. So uh, from an RSP perspective, it's the last week. March 1st is the last day of RSP season this year. You know, we've spoken to a number of clients this week and still some people coming to us. So, you know, we can uh, we can pull it out of the account with your authority. So just let us know if, if you have if you haven't got to us and you intend to do it uh, before the end of um, this month. Yep. Good point. Get them in. Okay. Perfect. All right, everybody. Well, that's it for uh, February 18th and we'll see you next week. Sounds good. Take care.